Hey guys and gals, uh, it's Mr. Kemple again with another fun, exciting video. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I think it is, but um, we're going to talk about our final assignment for the year, which is um, having to do with industrial design, specifically toy design. Um, if you don't know what industrial design is, it's basically a subset of designing where um, you are kind of dealing with the the design of kind of everyday utilitarian objects, um, things like furniture, um, tools, appliances, and and um, implements, things like that. Um, and one subset of industrial design is toys, toy design, um, which is kind of a fun thing that I think will be a great introduction for you guys into the world of, of 3D, um, working in 3D and sculpting. And um, it's just something that's, I think, kind of cool. Um, so that's what we're going to be dealing with for the last project of the year. Um, so let's get started. Um, so toy design, like any other kind of design, utilizes aesthetics or the way something looks, um, engineering, um, usability, and the uh, phenomenon of the attachment of the user to, to an object. Um, certain types of, of play mechanics um, can drive the type of toy you're trying to design. Um, I'm sure all of you, when you were younger, had a favorite toy that you used to play with for whatever reason. And it was the type of thing that you enjoyed. Um, it could the reasons could vary. It could just be because you liked the way it looked, you liked the way it felt in your hand, you liked the way that, um, you know, maybe it performed some function that you thought was really cool. Like I know when I was a kid, they still make these transformers, right? Um, I there were certain transformers that I had, and I just kind of liked the way. You know, I would just repeat it in my, you know, I'd, I'd hold it and I would just kind of transform the toy back and forth between a robot and a car or whatever it was. And just the act of doing that, it gave my hand something to do, kind of like a fidget cube. Other back then we didn't have fidget cubes, but same idea. Um, so there's a lot of different um, things to consider when you're designing a toy. Um, so, you know. You can identify certain connections that, that kids can make with toys. So if something is really well designed, a child is going to make a connection with a toy that might last their whole lives. They might remember it well into adulthood. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia in the toy market now for people who remember certain toys from when they were younger, like Slinkies or Etch-a-Sketches or something like that. And, um, you know, as adults, they they have fond memories and they associate certain memories and experiences with that toy. Um, so it can be a very powerful thing. Um, toys are not just kind of trivial playthings; they can they can have a deeper meaning for people. Um, so, you know, when we talk about design, um, we're talking about a multitude of things: the way it looks, the way it feels, what it does. That all goes into the um, process. Um, design is everywhere you look, okay? Anything that is man-made in our daily lives has to be designed by somebody. So everything from the cars we drive to the clothes we wear, the shoes we have on our feet, the, um, the, bottle, the water bottles we drink out of, um, the power tools we use, like, you know, drills and screwdrivers and corkscrews and, you know, spoons and forks, all of that is designed by someone. And a lot of times we don't 
think about that. We we take it for granted, but it's it's someone's job to design those things and plan how they look, how they feel in our hands when we use them. Is it comfortable? Um, does it have a grip on it? You know, and there's all kinds of aesthetic considerations, like how how streamlined does it look? Um, what color is it? Um, all there's an infinite number of considerations. Um, so it's actually a very um, complex kind of an issue. Don't assume that because something is made for a child that there isn't a lot of um, careful planning and thought that goes into it because because the, there is. Um, toys are objects, but they can also be considered a, an art, a piece of art, um, because they incorporate all the elements and principles of design that we've been talking about all year long. Um, line, shape, color, value, um, form, um, style, repetition, all that stuff goes into consideration when you are designing anything, um, even even a toy. Um, so the toy kind of has to meet several different criteria. Is it fun to play with? And does it look appealing to a child or to whoever your target audience is? All right, toys can be educational, um, but they can also just be fun. Um, so that you can you can kind of strike a balance between the two of those. Um, so it's something to think about. All right. So in this assignment, you're going to be asked to choose a theme and then to design a toy based on that theme. And one of the things you need to consider when you're designing is who is your audience? Okay. So here's a couple of examples um, specifically that, I'll, that I want to talk about. Um, on the left, you've got these Finding Nemo toys, and on the right, you have toys from the movie Ice Age. Now, one thing about design that you'll want to keep in mind is that if, if something is designed really well, you often don't notice it because the design is so well integrated that you don't think about it. It's usually only when something is poorly designed that, that you know, attention is drawn to how it's made or how poorly it's made. Um, so here's a couple of examples of what I consider to be good design and I'll explain why. So we'll start with the left-hand example with Finding Nemo. Okay, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen this movie multiple times. Um, this movie was probably new when you guys were really little. It may have been slightly before your time, but I doubt it. But I'm sure you guys have all seen this. Um, so the characters are, easy, are you know, pretty easily identifiable. You recognize them. Um, and they also have a very friendly kind of uh, design. Okay, they're, you know, what I would call like cute in quotes, they're, 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 they're cutified. Um, they've basically taken designs that were already pretty appealing for kids and made them even more cute and more appealing by giving them very simple shapes, um, a lot of spherical shapes and, and smooth edges, um, big eyes, all right? There's one surefire way to make something cute is to give it really big eyes. Um, that take up most of the face, um, smiling mouths. Okay, these are very inviting, friendly toys for kids. All right, I, I, a little kid, even the with Bruce the shark down there on the lower left corner. I mean, even he is designed in a very cute, appealing way for a child. Um, so already right off the bat, you've got a very inviting kind of a of a design aesthetic going. Very smooth, rounded shapes, um, kind of cute expressions um, and proportions, um, you know, big heads, little bodies, 
Um, that's also a very kind of a pleasing kind of a, a design aesthetic for a child. Um, nice bright colors, but not garish colors. Um, very shiny. Okay. So from just an aesthetic standpoint, they're very inviting and well and well designed. So if you are trying to attract if your audience is to attract little children, this has already got a lot going for it. Um, but then on top of that, in terms of the functionality, um, these are like bath or pool toys, right? So you take them in the, you know, kids love to play in water. So whether it's the bathtub or the swimming pool. Um, and for this type of theme, this makes perfect sense because, again, it's Finding Nemo. All of these characters live in the water. The whole story takes place underwater. So it's a no-brainer, really, to make these toys um, water toys. Um, and whether they swim, they have a swimming feature, like a wind-up kind of a motor inside them, or whether they kind of squirt water, or even if they just float, um, they are designed to be played with in the water, right? They can get wet. It's safe for them to get wet. Um, so again, from all from all aspects, from the appearance to the functionality, this is these are this is a strong design. This this makes sense in terms of what the theme is and in terms of what the audience is. Okay. On the right hand side, uh, if you guys have seen the Ice Age films, um, this is a slightly different approach where we have a more um, practical, functional use. Okay, these are toys, but they're not just meant to be played with. There is a more interactive feature where um, each character comes with a cup that has a kind of bass relief um, design on the on the cup to represent the character. Um, but then each, in addition to that, each cup comes with this little base um, that's like a mold. And what you can do is pour juice or some other kind of liquid into those molds, put it in the freezer, and then it'll actually make a little popsicle, a little ice pop of that character, all right? Which, again, to me is ingenious, okay? Such a great idea. Um, and I'm not sure. I think the little figurines on, on the molds might actually be removable. So you're basically getting three toys in one for for this, okay? You're getting a figurine, you're getting a, a, a drinking cup, and you're getting um, a, a popsicle mold, okay? So Which is just amazing that you would actually get this for free, you know, at a restaurant. That's pretty cool to me. Um, so aesthetically, we are dealing with, again, a, you know, a very well done product right the characters all look they you know they they, they strongly resemble they're on model they, they strongly resemble the uh movie versions but uh you know so they're they're very appealing to kids but they're not overly stylized like the nemo ones are right they're they're pretty much screen accurate um maybe not in terms of scale obviously the the woolly mammoth characters would be much bigger in comparison, but there are certain limitations there. Um, nice bright colors. Um, so they're very aesthetically pleasing. Um, but having the the freezing aspect of, of making a popsicle and putting it in the freezer is such a clever idea. And it fits in so well with the Ice Age theme. Um, Again, just a really, in my opinion, a very clever design. Uh, I don't even think these were available in, in America. I think these were probably a European promotion, which is kind of a shame. But um, just great, in my opinion, great, great designs. Uh, the, the toys look interesting. If I was a kid, I can really picture myself wanting to play with this. Um, you know, I might not have the patience to wait for something to freeze, you know. <clears throat> that might be something the parents do, but, you know, you can always play with the other parts of the toy. Um, so, again, a really well-done concept and a really well-done execution. Um, 
so again, in both examples, very clear um, sense of who the toys are targeted to, um, a very clear sense of the theme being reflected in the concept of the toy. So you've got water for Nemo, water play, and then you've got uh, a freezing aspect for the Ice Age things. Um, so again, just all around really well done, I think. Um, here's some more examples, okay? Now, looking at these, hopefully you can tell who the target audience is, is meant for, who, who's the demographic. Now, I am not personally a fan of uh, gender bias. Like, I don't think that only boys can play with G.I. Joes and only girls can play with Hello Kitty. I think toys should be a little more unisex in that regard. But having said that, for whatever reason, a lot of toy companies are more traditional in terms of gender roles and that sort of thing. So um, just for the purposes of this discussion, we'll kind of take a traditional approach, even though personally I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it. I think that, you know, if a, if a little boy wants to play with a quote unquote girl toy, that should be fine and allowed and vice versa for girls. I think girls should be able to play with Batman and boys should be able to play with My Little Pony. I don't, I don't see why that should be a big deal. Um, but anyway, having said that, looking at these examples here, you can see, again, we are looking at more of a girl type of approach, a female target demographic. The reason why I say that is because, set for several things, number one, the choice of colors and palette, okay? We've got lots of pastel colors, pinks, and light blues and light greens, all right, colors that we again, traditionally associate with girls, even though, again, that is a gender stereotype. But if we're talking about tradition, that is sort of the case. Um, also, just the, the types of shapes that we see in these designs, they're all kind of, again, circular, rounded, and kind of floral patterns. Um, like fruit and, and polka dots and hair bows and hearts and stars and flowers, okay? I mean, again, these are all traditionally associated with more of a, of a little girl type of appeal, okay? Um, finally, character choice is another one, all right? We have lots of, again, we've got the cute factor ratcheted up to 11 here, all right? So you've got lots of cute animals baby animals and hello kitty is of course a classic that's been around for since i was a, a little kid um hello kitty is very popular with young girls um and strawberry shortcake is also a, a kind of an older theme that uh, an older property from back when i was a kid um so again the subject matter like young girls um, uh, cute animals. These are all traditionally appealing to little girls specifically. Um, we also want to look at what are the toys doing in terms of function, okay? Um, usually when we're talking about young girls, we're thinking about things like decorating or role-playing or accessorizing with jewelry or things like writing and drawing and putting stickers on things and stationery and, and stamping. Okay, these are kind of traditionally, again, I, I keep, I hate that I keep saying this because I, I really hate stereotyping, but, you know, traditionally these are thought of as little girls are more into this stuff. Um, it shouldn't necessarily be that way, but that's the way it has been marketed. Uh, so you have a lot of um, those types of activities being um, incorporated into the toy. So you have in the upper left, the 
littlest pet shop and you've got these little I think I remember my daughters even having some of these when they were little these little animals that are on a base and I think they're they're like little bobbleheads so their heads kind of go back and forth but each base comes with some kind of a little accessory um, like the ladybug comes with a bracelet and that bracelet and you can see that at the, at the bottom left there the bracelet actually snaps on to the bottom of the of the base so it's like a little holder but you can also take it off and wear it and there's little stickers that it comes with so you can decorate it so it's like a again multi-faceted toy you've got the character but you've also got the the bracelet and the stickers that go along with it um there's one that comes with like a little pinwheel um or just little stickers or you know like one is like a little container for stickers um one of them is like a little flower clip that you can clip it on your book bag i think one of them has like a little like a stencil set that clips to the bottom um so the again little different accessories um the strawberry shortcake ones the upper right corner um the little figurines are very cute and they i think they're scented to be like orange or strawberry, blueberry, whatever. And then each one again comes with a little accessory, like a bookmark or, you know, a pad and paper or a cookie cutter or a little hand mirror, okay? A little ice cream spoon. All right, and then finally the Hello Kitty ones at the bottom. Um, again, they're all kind of related to stationery or writing, so um hole punch or a little pencil holder a little sticker holder um etc okay so again these are all i mean you could design boy toys that kind of use this similar type of concept but you probably wouldn't want them to have you know hand mirrors and and little bow hair bows and stuff they probably bracelets they probably have different types of of you know of play associated with it but so again from every aspect these are being marketed towards girls either really young girls or slightly you know from i'd say from ages like four to to eight or nine okay um let's take a look at boys now all right what's the difference that we can see now between these and what we just looked at um the color choices i think are a little bolder we're dealing more with primary bright flat colors um so you're dealing with again like reds yellows and blues um we're dealing more with um kineticism kineticism is another word for just motion or action so you've got toys that are dealing with action the toys move somehow they are either like on wheels like little cars that, that shoot things or they're figurines but they have little uh, buttons that um, make the parts move make the arms move the legs kick or some other kind of aspect um, so you're dealing more with a sense of, of, I don't want to say conflict, but you're you're inviting more of a sense of, of again, I don't, aggressiveness is not really the right word, but you're inviting more action, um, which is again is associated more traditionally with boys. Okay, again, I think girls should be able to do this too. Um, but it's usually a guy thing, like where you want to smash things or shoot things or make things punch or kick or whatever, okay? Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing here, and that's different from what we just looked at with the girl stuff. Because remember, the girl stuff was more about decorating and accessorizing and, and being creative and drawing with stencils and you're dealing more with like craft making, letter writing, artsy types of things. And this is more like, let's, you know, shoot this missile with this guy and 
punch him and make this thing fly or, you know, roll this across the table. Okay, so again, a very different play mechanic is being used to target boys specifically. Um, so, um, but again, in terms of design, you can sort of see other differences too, like the use of kind of pattern, like kind of that dot pattern there in the in the background and the the brighter colors, um, that sort of thing. So, hopefully, that helps to show you some examples of you know thinking about how to attract a certain audience. Like, what are you using design wise? Um, and play activity-wise to attract a certain audience. Okay, this is leading us to the ty different types of toys that there are. All right, I've kind of narrowed them down to three. Um, when you are designing your toy, you need to make sure that each design you do is based on a three-dimensional representation of a character. Like you can't just have, and let me go back um, one, back to this. Like you see how on some of these, like for example, in the Justice League toys, you've got Wonder Woman's tiara or a Supergirl headband or a Hawkman mask. Like I do not want you to design any toys like that. All right. Make sure that you have a three-dimensional representation of a character. See how all of these toys for the most part are a character and incorporate a character in some way i also don't want you to design like a car like just a car if you're going to have a vehicle in it make it like this starfire figure down here in the in the teen titans version you see how you know you can still see the character even though it's a, it's a rolling vehicle you can still see her kind of sitting there okay um, make sure you're doing that kind of a design. I don't want to just see a car or just see like an accessory. All right, I'll go back one more. Like I also don't want to see anything like this where you're designing like a flat drawing, like a bag or a, something like this. It needs to be a three-dimensional character um, because this is going to fulfill the 3D um, component of the curriculum. So your toys need to need to reflect that. All right. So I hope that makes sense. So make sure you're designing a, you know, you've got a three dimensional character somehow as part of your design. All right. So <clears throat> it cannot be an inanimate object such as a vehicle, car, gun, a weapon, a game, a tool, etc. It's got to incorporate that character somehow in the sculpt. All right. So you've got three choices. You can either make a kinetic toy, meaning that it moves somehow. So that means it can like roll on wheels or it can shoot a projectile. It can incorporate some kind of a wind up or pull back mechanism to move. So it can include any kind of motion, movement or action in the playability of the toy. All right. This is a harder kind of toy to design from scratch, but it can be done. And I'll show you some examples later. Um, a static toy means that it's the opposite of kinetic, right? It's it it does not have moving parts. It's it's it just it's like a it stands still. It's just like an a, it's an object that just kind of sits there, um, which is not very challenging, not very good. So if you decide to go this route, you're going to need to make sure that what you have is sculpted really, really, really well. Um, Okay, but it can be like a keychain or a stamper, like a, you know, you can put a little, make a little stamp, like a rubber stamp for the bottom of it. Like it could be like a finger puppet or, you know, something along those lines. I had a student one year make a, make a magic eight ball. It was like a Mike Wazowski um, figure, like from Monsters, Inc., the little green guy with the one eye. And she put like a little miniature magic eight ball inside of him. Um, so that he was like a little static figure, but when you turn him upside down, he actually did something. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, I've had some students make pencil sharpeners. Okay. So something can be static, but still be, you know, it serves a purpose. And that brings us into the final one, practical. All right. A toy can serve a practical function. It can be a container for something. It can hold something. 
It can be some kind of tool or utensil. All right, or a game of some kind, as long as the game has three-dimensional components to it that, that involve a character. All right. So, and you can combine them. Like something could be static and practical, um, potentially. All right. One another great uh, practical example was I had a student one year do Russell from uh, from the movie Up. The you know the little Boy Scout character. And um, she used a, like one of those plastic hollow Easter eggs you get at Easter, like with the, with the candy inside. And she kind of used that to sculpt on top of, so she sculpted a Russell on top of that, which worked because he's kind of a short, pudgy character anyway. So the proportions of the egg were, were perfect. And she actually made his little scout sash be like a sticker roll. And he had like stickers inside of them and it was in and each sticker was like a little scout badge and she made the stickers herself and it was such a wonderful clever design it was really cool all right so those are your three choices kinetic static or practical um to think about all right again you, you can combine those two all right so once you've thought about all of that Here's the actual process of, of making these, these, these toys, okay? Step one is gonna just be thinking it through on paper. As artists and designers, um, everything we do starts out with drawing, all right? Drawing is the origin for, for everything. No matter what it's gonna eventually be, whether it's gonna be a painting or a sculpture or whatever it is, we start out by sketching. Um, and you're just kind of, at this point, not limiting yourself. You're kind of just shooting for the moon and trying to sketch out anything. So what character are you going to use? And then you're just sort of practicing, like, okay, what's this toy going to look like? What are the proportions of the parts? Is it going to be more like realistic proportions, like the superhero guy on the right? Or is it going to be more of a cartoony thing like on the left where it's like a big head little body type of cutesy chibi kind of a kind of a design all right you're just you're just kind of experimenting on paper all right so this is this is the stage where you want to do a lot of sketches and they don't have to be super detailed but you want to do a lot of sketching all right because this is where your ideas are going to come from so just do lots of, of little doodles in your sketchbook um, and think with your pencil, okay? Play with scale and proportion and style. Draw and redraw multiple times, okay? Don't deny any idea at first. No matter how crazy or ambitious it is, just, just entertain it for a little bit. If you eventually decide it's too much to do, then try to simplify it. But in the beginning, you shouldn't ever limit yourself. Like, just the sky's the limit at first. All right, and you might combine ideas they might find like two or three ideas that you like and you might decide oh i'm going to take the top half of this one and the bottom half of this other one and combine them together and make a new design out of it all right but you won't get there unless you actually do the drawing so you know a lot of students are lazy and won't do this stage and it's a huge mistake and then they wind up with toys that aren't very good and their grade reflects that. So I want you guys to do a lot of drawing and I wanna actually see what you draw the first week or so of this, okay? The first few days of it. Um, and just remember, you're trying to implement a three-dimensional version of a character in your toy. So for example, if you're doing Star Wars, um, don't just make a lightsaber or just one of the vehicles or spaceships. Like you need to, like, if you're going to do like a land speeder, you can do that, but have like, you need to sculpt like Luke Skywalker inside of it, you know, or something like that, or one of the droids or something. And they can be big, it can be kind of cartoony proportions, but you know, you need to actually do that. Okay. Um, your drawings can be loose, but they should be clear. Um, and hopefully these examples are, are 
are good to kind of show you how you're not only just playing with the proportions and the shapes, stuff like that, but you're also starting to think about, okay, what's going to what's gonna happen with my toy? Like the arms move or come off or this middle section here is um, concepts for a, like a light projector toy. And you can see here how the, the artist is playing with, you know, do I put the projector here in the middle on the belly of the snail or do I put it in the eyes or you, know, you can even see how the the style of the snail is changing like in some of them it's like he doesn't really have a head just big eyes popping up and then in other ones it, he actually has a head and a face you know so you can see how it's all the same toy but lots of different design approaches to the same toy okay so after you have done your concept sketching and, and, and narrowed it down to, to a good idea or two, then you're going to start thinking about the functionality a little more. Like, what is the toy actually going to do? And again, that goes back to your, is it kinetic? Is it static? Is it practical? Is it a combination? And then you need to actually work that out on paper. Like this example here is like a Spider-Man top that spins and it's, like a little base, like a figurine base, but then the bottom of it is actually like a little, has a little mechanism that will shoot a little top out and make it spin. You know, or this one for Pocahontas, I think I remember these toys from a while back, and like each one came on like a little storybook and had a little lever on it, and then when you rolled it, like the characters would dance or do whatever, and I think you could actually link these up and make like a little train out of them. So when you collected all eight of them, you know, and you pulled the train along, all the toys would, would move or dance or spin or do something. It's kind of cool. Again, that's a very ambitious idea. I'm not saying you got to do something that that fancy. I don't expect that, but it's, you know, it's, it's neat. It's a neat idea. All right, so once you have the functionality down, the next step is to draw turnarounds of the final version of your toy and the reason why you want turnarounds is because you want to use these to sculpt from so a turnaround is basically just a drawing where you're showing the same toy from three different views like from the front from the side and maybe like a three-quarter view or from the back all right and again this is so that like as you're sculpting your toy you can like be rotating it and look at it from different angles and, and see that it's matching the drawings okay and in each of these examples again you can see their the artist is going for more of a that chibi kind of a style big head little body kind of a style which i recommend for this because it's easier to sculpt so um again you can see on all these examples the drawing is very the forms are very simple and dealing with large kind of circular shapes and um it's easy to to work with for for a beginner so and it's also more inviting for a little kid so something to consider all right once you have gotten the turnarounds done the next phase is actual sculpting okay and there's a lot here on the slide i i i grant you but um we're going to be using Super Sculpey, which is something that you are going to need to buy, unfortunately. All right. I don't have it to give you, um, but I will give you plenty of links to where you can order it. It's not that expensive. It's like around 10 bucks or so. Maybe like a little more, a couple bucks more um, for like a little one pound box of it. And that's plenty for what we're doing. And Sculpey is a polymer clay that um, when you bake it in the oven, it hardens and then you can paint it um sand it do whatever you want to do to it um so you can see in these examples here that um there's several different types of toys being made spongebob super mario um harry potter how to train your dragon okay but in each of these examples the design is pretty much the same and it really kind of reflects or mirrors what we've been doing all year long with painting and drawing whereas you're dealing with the concept of working from the general to the specific right so you're starting off with simple 
shapes, we start off by looking at the proportional relationship, scale and proportion of, of, of shapes. And then you gradually are working towards details. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So in all these examples, you see that you're starting off with just like a simple cube or a simple sphere, like sphere for a, for a head. And then you're kind of building the toy piece by piece. And the details kind of happen in layers gradually. And it's just like it is with a drawing or anything else, okay? So, hopefully that makes sense. Now, I'm going to make another video where I'm actually going to try making my own toy. Um, and you guys can see it um, develop. Um, but I'm just kind of showing you this for now that, that you know, this to say that this is kind of the next the, the next step after you do your turnarounds. Um, and believe me, with each of these examples, I'm sure that the artist did some sketches first before they went to the sculpting stage. So, after sculpting, um, one other thing I'll say about it is that you can also use an armature um, when you're sculpting. An armature just means you have like a little wire or tin foil um, little skeleton that you're sculpting on top of. Um, sometimes, like especially if you're doing like a more human character, like like this one here in the middle. Sometimes it helps to, to kind of sculpt, a, uh, or if you're doing like a, a character that's movable, like a little action figure, sometimes if you have like wire underneath and you sculpt on top of it, you can have little parts that, that move at, even after it's baked. But even if not, um, it just gives um, a sense of inner structure to your toy so things don't just kind of fall apart. It also makes them more lightweight, especially like if you have like a more closed in figure. If you make the center of that like tin foil or something, it'll be much more lightweight. Um, and it also won't use up as much Sculpey. You don't want your toy to be like this big rock, this heavy rock of a toy. Um, so the, the, the more you can do to, to lighten it up, especially if you have like a rolling mechanism or something on it or inside of it, if it's too heavy, it won't it won't work right so um using an armature is actually a really good idea and again it can be wire or tin foil or both now you guys might not have wire at home but i know you you've got to have tin foil um so you can just use a little bit of that and um it's a really good idea um just make sure that if you are using like another like if you're going to kit bash the toy which is basically another word for like cannibalizing parts of other toys and using them like if you have a a little shooter gun thing that you want to use from another toy or, or like a little motor or, or wind up mechanism that you're going to use you definitely want to make sure that you are when you sculpt your toy on top of it make sure that it's removable so that you can take that part off bake it in the oven and then when it's all baked and hard you can put it back on top of the wheels or the motor or whatever it is um, and then glue it on because if you put the whole thing in the oven it'll melt like I've seen lots of kids like they, they've got the whole thing sculpted and it works but then they put it in the oven and it and and the internal parts melt and then the little wind-up thing doesn't work anymore so but if you do it right and you really think it through, you think through the design, you can make a really, really good looking toy that works. And that's always an A plus. It's, it's a... All right. If you are going to go that route and you are going to use like other parts from like another toy that you have or that you want to use, like remember I told you about the girl that did the um, the thing with the Russell stickers inside, um, and you want other parts of your toy, or like you like, or I told you about the one with the little magic eight ball inside, the Mike Wazowski. Um, here are some possible places you can go, either online or to the actual store if they're open. Some of these are not 
going to be available right now because of the situation. Um, but some of them still will. Um, but there are lots of places that, that sell cheap little rack toys or party favor type toys um, that will work really well um, if you incorporate them in your toy. Um, so like, you know, if a toy squirts water or has a little magic eight ball inside of it or a little pencil sharpener or if it's like a little movie viewer or something, um, here are some great places to go. Party City. Um, they have a whole section of party favor toys that are really cheap, um, just a few bucks. So you might want to consider that. Michaels, of course, has similar has a similar section. Um, and Michaels, I believe, I don't, I think Party City as well. Both Michaels and Party City have websites that you can order from, but they also have curbside delivery. So even if you can't walk into the store, um, if you call them or just order it online, you can just drive up to the store and like call them when you get there and they will bring your stuff out to you. So that might be a good, a good thing. Um, dollar store, Walmart and Target, sometimes they have stuff, sometimes they don't. Flea market, I don't think is open right now. So that's probably not an option, but normally a flea market would be a great place to find like old Happy Meal toys, you know, that you can buy and use. Um, maybe you have something in your house. Maybe you've got a, a, some younger brothers or sisters that uh, have old toys that are just laying around like collecting dust and maybe you can swipe one of those and use it. Um, eBay or online or Amazon. Amazon has everything and Amazon ships really quickly. Especially if you're a Prime customer, like so, you can order something online, like a bag of little Magic Eight Balls or a bag of wind-up cars or whatever they have, and get free shipping to your house within a couple of days, and it's easy peasy. All right, so think about that. Those are those are some options for you. Okay, but when it, whenever you can, try to take advantage of either getting something just shipped to your house or curbside delivery. I don't want anyone like going into a store. That's not safe. But if you can have it delivered to your house or have it brought out to you, then I, you know that's that's a good a good option. All right, really quickly, here are some examples of of student work, actual projects for this assignment. Uh, the first one up top is uh, Harry Potter, um, obviously. And this student, she was really not confident in her sculpting skills. Um, she was like going to make them based on the movie. But she wasn't confident that she could get a likeness of, of you know, Daniel Radcliffe. And I don't, you know, blame her because I don't think I could either. So we, we came up with a great compromise where instead of using the movie versions, she's using the storybook versions um and this was a while ago so i think she had a version of the book that was illustrated and in the illustrations harry had a red robe instead of a black robe um and this again this was years ago so it was one of the earlier editions and um so she went with that and it's you know it's it's a little cartoony version but it it works okay and she had a little wind up um football toy i don't know where she got it from but she just had it sitting in her house so she had the idea of sculpting harry potter on top of this wind-up toy so that when you wind it up and let it go it looks like he's zooming along on his broomstick and it works really well now when she first sculpted it she used pure sculpey and it was so heavy that the thing wouldn't roll so she had to actually tear it off put tin foil in the middle and then she sculpted it on top of the tin foil and then it made it much lighter and then the toy worked really well um and then she basically sculpted him separately and baked him in the oven so that he could harden and then once he was out of the oven she put him back on top of the wind-up toy and glued him in place and then painted him um so that it didn't melt Okay, so this is a great example of a kit bash toy that works really well. 
A um, couple of Finding Nemo toys down here. Um, the one on the left is like a little squirt turtle character. Um, and, and he's a little bubble dispenser, which is a really ingenious idea, that I thought. Um, she just got a little miniature bubble wand from Party City or somewhere. And she just sculpted around it and made a little little squirt bubble thing. It was a really a really neat idea. On the right hand side, you've got Peach, and there's two of them because I th this particular year I had them sculpt a bigger version out of clay, and then they did a smaller version that was the actual toy. So I don't know if you can tell in the picture, but on the left hand side, that's the actual toy version, and she just put little suction cups on the ends of of uh, Peach's, I think her name was Peach, yeah, the, the starfish, put little suction cups on the end so that you could either stick her on the tiles of the bathtub or you could stick her inside an aquarium or a shower door or a mirror or whatever. And again, it worked really well. And it that's exactly what the character in the movie does, so it, it works out perfect. A um, couple more here. A little stitch inside of a spaceship, and I think the spaceship is on wheels, so it rolls. But you, you know that you can take the stitch out of the uh, out of the ship. But again, notice it's a three dimensional representation of a character. They didn't just do the ship; they did stitch as well. There's some South Park characters with, um, for some reason, the heads could pop off. I think she she used ping pong balls for the heads. And again, the bigger ones on the left are the clay versions, and then the ones on the right are the actual toys. So it had this kind of unintended effect where you could pop the heads off and stick them on other bodies if you wanted to. But I think, yeah, she just sculpted around the ping pong ball, and then she just had like a little nail sticking up that she stuck it on. Not very safe for kids, but <laughs> it was fine. This is another uh, view of that um, bubble wand. Um, on the from the previous slide, uh, lower left is uh, from the cartoon Rugrats. If you guys remember that at all, it was an old Nickelodeon cartoon back in the day, um, and it's just like a a little rolling toy. She used like a little Hot Wheels car that she sculpted on top of, um, and I think you can take the little character out of it. Again, it's not just the vehicle; it's the character too. And at some point, she changed her mind from the clay version to the final version and made it a, a dinosaur instead of a duck. And then for the last one, this is like an original idea, which is something you can do. You can actually make up your own thing if you want to. You don't have to use an established theme. Um, and she wanted to do something based on like an, with an environmental message. So she came up with this Recycle Man character. And she made a little game out of it. So, like, she made a little uh, recycle bin, and she made little Sculpey cans and bottles, and it was some kind of a little flipper thing that she made that you could, like, flick the, uh, try to flick the cans and bottles into the basket. So that was kind of cool. All right, so, I mean, these are pretty great ideas. And they run the gamut between um, kinetic and practical and static okay so there's a lot of possibilities here uh, a few more um this is a another nemo one nemo is a very popular a lot of a lot of kids want to do nemo here's mr ray um and he actually is on wheels he has a little wheeled mechanism inside of him and then Nemo goes on top, and there's a little magnet in there that holds him in place so that when they roll along, he doesn't fly off. So that was kind of a clever idea. Okay. Um, Totoro, if you guys are familiar with My Neighbor Totoro, great, great kids movie. This is like a nesting doll made out of a hollow Easter egg, plastic Easter egg. Um, so when you open them up, there's smaller little Totoros inside. All right, here's another Nemo. Um, this is just a static toy. It's just um, a dory with some little coral and stuff, but so well sculpted. Just really well done. Really on model. Just 
nicely done. It's 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 like again what I said earlier. Like if you're gonna do a static toy that doesn't do anything, it at least better look really good. And she totally nailed that. Like the toy doesn't do anything, but it looks so good. It looks professional. It looks almost like store bought. So like it to me like that made up for it. So that was fine. And then finally at the bottom. Um, again, a kind of a girl's toy idea of like a a little bust of a of a character, and the idea is you could like do her makeup and 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 style her hair. So she used like a real yarn for the hair, and you could like you know put her, put different hairstyles on her, clip little bows in her hair. So again, geared towards little girls. Um, great idea. So again, all these examples, you've got a three dimensional version of a character. As part of the design okay all right so let's do a quick review here of this process all right step one is you're going to choose your theme and again that theme can either be an already existing movie tv show video game or it can be something that you make up yourself and then once you choose that theme you're going to just do lots of sketching lots of doodling in your sketchbook trying to come up with different ideas for your toy all right, while you're sketching, you need to be thinking about who is your target audience going to be? Like what the what's the age group, the gender, all that stuff. Um, and then think about what types of characters or story elements from your theme could you incorporate into your design? What kind of game, uh, what kind of play activity are you going to incorporate? Think back to the beginning of this presentation where we saw we saw the Nemo bath toys and the um, Ice Age popsicle makers and you know the Batman toys that that shot missiles or the you know the My Little Littlest Pet Shop toys that it was like a little figurine but it also had like a little bracelet attached to it or whatever. Okay, think about that. And then come up with several different types of ideas and you kind of develop them in sketch form. All right. What can your toy do? What type of toy is it? What's it going to look like from different angles, etc.? Does it come apart? Does it move? Is it hollow? Explore all the stuff just with little sketches. They don't have to be super detailed or elaborate. Just quick little sketches. Um, sketch a lot and be ready to show what you have. But just remember that that design has to incorporate the three-dimensional character in it. So you can't just have like a vehicle or a weapon or a prop or a, something with like a flat drawing. Like I don't want to see that. Like some kids want to do like a puzzle and they just do a drawing and then cut up the drawing. No, that's not a three-dimensional. There's nothing three-dimensional about that. So you can't do that sort of thing. Okay. All right, once you've got the theme and these, these sketch ideas, step two is narrow down those ideas and choose your strongest one. Then do some final drawings, turnaround drawings of that idea. So sketch from the front, the side, three quarter view, or the back. And then you're gonna use those drawings. I'm gonna grade you on those drawings. Um, it's gonna be part of your grade. So you don't skip that step. Um, and, you know, think about structure drawing. When we, when we worked with structure drawing back, you know, I know a lot of you don't want to remember that because you hated it. But when you're sketching something that's going to be 3D, think about how to make something look volumetric in a drawing, right? Finding the, the, the center lines, the symmetry. Use your ellipses, you know, try to make it look three-dimensional in the drawing. Uh, step three is you're going to get your Sculpey and whatever else you need, your wire, your tin foil, whatever, and you're going to start sculpting it. So you definitely got to make sure you got your Sculpey ordered and, and ready by the time you get to this stage. So like as soon as you start thinking about, like I would order your Sculpey this week so that it'll hopefully show up by next week, by next class, okay? Um, and then just start sculpting. And again, I'm going to do a video for you guys that, so that you'll see what that looks like, hopefully. Um, that'll hopefully help you. Help you. All right. And if you have any other stuff that you're going to use, like 
parts of other toys, whatever. Make sure you've got all that stuff too. Um, and if you're getting in, if you're going to use anything like that, make sure you sculpt it separately and bake it separately and then attach it after it's baked. Otherwise, it'll melt. Okay. Make sure your sculpt doesn't have big lumps or fingerprints or wrinkles on it either. Keep it nice and smooth. Um, like, don't, because you can't smooth it after it's baked. So smooth it all before it's baked and then bake it. All right, and then the final step, once it's all baked and it works, hopefully, then you're going to paint it with your acrylic paints. All right, and get it looking good. All right, and that's it, okay? So again, I'm going to make more videos of me actually going through some of these steps, and I'll show you some of my drawings and kind of how I approach it. Uh, but this is going to be the last project of the year, so this is going to take us up to exam day. Again, this is not a exam grade, but... This is going to be the final project of the year. So we've, we've got a few weeks to work on this. So this should be enough time, but you can't, you can't wait to the last minute to do this. You need to kind of be working on it a little bit each week. Okay. So I'll, I'll, in the, in the next bulletin, I'm going to give you links, not only to the video, this video, but also to where to get the, buy the Sculpey from. Don't wait. Buy the Sculpey as soon as you can, like this week. So that way it'll get here in time for you to use it. All right. Okay. So I've gone longer than I meant to on this video in explaining things, but I wanted to make sure you understood. Please go back and rewatch, rewind any parts of it you didn't you didn't quite get. Um, email me with any questions or or ask in the Zoom if you have any questions, and um, just start thinking about your theme. And just start sketching in your sketchbook. That's the first step of this, okay? So brainstorming and sketching, that's the first step, all right? So good luck. We'll talk to you soon, and thanks. Bye-bye.